just going to constantly be pumping water out of there because there's always going to be water in, in it. Until the lakes are all empty, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, it's gonna, and that's the thing. It's just going to be a loop. You know, he's going to be dumping it into the lake and the lake's going to dump it back in his basement. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Editorial Director Brian Pontalillo. Hello, Brian. Hey, everyone. Uh, Deputy Editor Matt Milham. How's it going? And our producer, Jeff Rose. Hi there. You can... Email questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. It's a pleasure to see you fellas this morning. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, man. It's good to see everybody. I was out on a job site for the first time in quite a while yesterday. It was quite exciting. I was visiting our uh, fine home building house in Greenwich, which is moving along quite well. (laughs) Yeah. How are they doing down there? It's a big project. Holy cow. Uh, there is tons to do uh, and they're getting it done, but I don't know how long it's been going now, but with the slowdowns of COVID and stuff, I'm sure it's starting to wear on everyone's nerves. I bet it was our, it was our uh, 2020 house. And what, where are we now? Almost we had to quit ju- describing it that way, right? June of 2021. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping that they finish before 2022. <laughs> They're getting there. They're starting to do the finishes on the interior now. Uh, like the, a lot of the kitchen cabinets are in uh, interior doors. So they're still doing some trim elements, but it's coming along nicely. You know, um, obviously everyone's aware that that uh, material prices are high and it's a, right now and that the sh- supply chain is is strained or or was strained and there's still um we're still feeling the effects of that and you know we have some we have some sponsors for our 2021 houses who are delivering products to those projects and um almost nearly all of them have been delayed and so even even the the actual manufacturers you know can't uh, can't deliver their products right now uh, on time. So it's really, I mean, everyone is has been hit by hit by these uh, shortages and and delays. Um, you know, all the way all the way along the supply chain. I, I guess. I learned that appliances are very hard to get. Uh, Albert was telling me he he recently finished his own home, and he's trying to get um, a sign off from the lender for his construction loan so he can get a conventional mortgage. Right. But they want to see appliances, and he can't get his induction cooktop, which I'm sure is extremely frustrating, because hmm. that's costing him probably you know hundreds or thousands of dollars, right? Mm-hmm. As the longer that's delayed. Yeah, that that's it, it. There's so many things along the way of the mortgage process that are so interesting. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I mentioned on the show a few weeks ago, I'm trying to buy a condo right now, and. There's a whole another set of criteria for condos that the mortgage companies look at. And, I'm sure it's much easier. <laughs> um, it's, it's it's actually quite it's actually quite interesting to see like some of the stuff that they come up with that that just kind of shut completely shuts down their willingness to give a loan uh, to give a, a mortgage. You know the the place that we're trying to buy is on the former site of a Civil War battle. And, <laughs> and since, and, and there's, so there's two, mo- there's two monuments within the, um, within the condo complex, there's two monuments, um, that a- apparently because these monuments are, are on the property part, there's, there's sort of a, a right of way. So basically the public has to be allowed to get to these monuments. So unlike any other single family home or, or most condo complexes, it's not completely private property. And so for whatever reason, the bank said, nope, because of that, that was, that was their reason. (laughs) So presumably you have to find a lender who will allow you to get a mortgage when you have civil war monuments on your property. Yes. You have to have a special lender, I guess. (laughs) The broker that we're working with thinks he can get an exception, but they, when the underwriter saw that, the first thing they said was no. I thought that, that what, what every, everything else is, has been approved and is on track. Uh, so what an interesting thing to kind of shut down a, shut down a otherwise otherwise uh, very reasonable and 
uh, approved loan. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. That's so weird. Like, I mean, it's not like the thing's in the condo, right? It's just it's somewhere on condo. the property. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> most of us live on public streets, you know, like, right. all kinds of cars can drive in front of my house. Like, there's no restriction on that. Yeah. Like, what's the difference? <laughs> yeah. It's it's fascinating. And you, you don't get to, of course, you don't get to talk to the underwriter. So I, yeah. you can't you can't kind of pick their brain and like, hey man, <laughs> yeah. what's this all about? <laughs> yeah, were you born dumb, <laughs> or did you have to work on it? <laughs> that is so weird. What have you been doing, Matt? <laughs> nothing. No gardening. Amazingly, you know. Yeah, nothing really time, around right? the house. Yeah. Yep. Mowed the lawn for the first time last weekend because. Uh, you know, we let it grow real long, mostly because, you know, the flowers and stuff in the lawn and there's mm-hmm. not a lot for the bees to get, you know, up until about this time. So, yeah, that had gotten pretty rangy. But, you know, as far as the rest of the house, absolutely nothing. What was the word you use, rangy? Yeah. As in, yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's uh, a new mower, right? Yeah, well, yeah, we got it around this time last year, I think. So, yeah, it's about a year old now. I bet that was fun. Yeah, it's nice. It actually cuts level, which is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been doing, Jeff? Uh, not a whole heck of a lot. Just, again, yard work. So I've got tons of mulch to spread. So Carol started setting her two tons of flagstone last weekend. And uh, I successfully avoided getting involved in that, which was awesome and allows her to have her creative outlet without me being in the way. So it was... Are you uh, extending the patio or... Yes, we're trying to build a Kennedy compound here as near as I can figure out. <laughs> nice. I think I've told you guys about, you know, some folks get a hobby of stone and pretty soon you have stone everywhere, right? I, I watched growing up this guy build a, a castle out of, you know, masonry uh, over a period of decades, but that's all he did. Hmm. Uh, in addition to his like dentistry practice, and then he'd come home and build on his house. Well, it's fun. And I mean, if you do it well, it's beautiful. So yeah, and it's inexpensive com- comparative to a lot of things, right? I mean, we were able to get two tons of stone for $1,000, you know, hmm. that's probably 20 square feet or more of uh, stone paving. And backbreaking hmm. work, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we got some great feedback as always. Uh, this comes from Mike in Seattle. Greetings, FHB. I think it was Patrick who was on an episode last month seeking decent gate hardware, specifically hinges. That was me. Uh, A few years back, I came across the adjustable strap hinge from, you guys think it's Lockinox or Lostinox? Uh, L-O-C-I-N-O-X. I I used the Lostinox hinge system and their Lostinox mortise latch on a gate project I built for a client. And it was a true joy to install due to its adjustability and the clean aesthetic. Keep up the fine podcast. It It is really good looking. I think that was outside of my budget, Mike. I got some ugly black strap hitches and painted them white and it seemed to work okay. <laughs> <laughs> but those are indeed beautiful. If you folks are out there want some gate hardware that doesn't look silly, this is the solution, I would say. What do you guys think? Probably. I haven't looked at them. I don't know if I want to look at them because I got some really bad strap hinges for a project that I did last year, building a little uh, enclosure for my garbage cans. And I hate looking at those hinges every time. <laughs> yeah. What is it about that, Matt? I don't know. I don't know. They, the problem is like I was trying, you know, it, it, it was kind of a silly design and I should have gotten the hinges before I built the rest of the thing because finding something that fit, it just didn't. <laughs> I don't know if I was ever going to find the right thing. This was beautiful stuff. Yeah, this uh, looks. This stuff looks really, really nice. <laughs> it's all stainless, and you can tell it's. It looks German or Swiss to me. It's also it's, a really nice gate. It's all beautiful, indeed. Yeah. Patrick and team. My name is Andrew Hove. I'm a fairly young builder in Durham, North Carolina. I just wanted to write in to say thank you. Your content in the magazine and on the podcast is superb. I really enjoy the practical help and information in an industry where quality help is often hard to find. I've been lucky to have a business partner who has taken me under his wing, but I only started building professionally three years ago. The learning curve is rough and steep. You guys have helped me a ton, and I'm grateful for this. 
I've listened to everything I can get my hands on from building science geeks and the passive house crowd. But I think there's a pretty big disconnect between the world, that world, and the reality the lot of us builders live in. It's awesome to see Steve Basic or Matt Reisinger pontificate on a $50,000 HVAC system and R40 wall assemblies, but what about a builder who is just trying to build a solid $300,000 spec house or a tradesman who works on affordable rental units? The real estate market here allows me to play in both the high-end world and the affordable space, but there seems to be a huge need in this country for solid houses between $250,000 and $400,000. I'd love to hear or see a multiple part series from a builder who makes decisions and executes a build in this price point. The reality is that you have to make some unsexy decisions when you're trying to hit a real world budget, but seeing and documenting that process and spending money in wise ways would be invaluable for the community and home building as an industry. Thanks again for everything, even if you hate my idea, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew, it's a fantastic idea. I, you know, we need that builder who's listening out there who wants to uh, tell us how to do this. And I think Andrew's totally right that you have to make hard decisions when you're dealing with the real world budget, especially now when material costs are three times what you expected. Yeah. I think Randy Williams did something like that maybe on his Instagram. I, I, I haven't checked it out entirely, but I remember something about that a while ago where, and I can't remember what he called it. Maybe you remember Brian. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was, he called it the code minimum house. Yeah. And, um, but because basically, you know, he wasn't building to any standard, um, beyond the building code, but he was doing some things along the way to really improve the performance of this very, otherwise very, you know, com kind of, you know, average house. And, um, and I think, you know, I, I, what I hope is that, the, you know, that when we publish stuff and when we share stuff that Matt and Steve and, and others are building, that is out of um, the, the norm, out of the norm and out of sort of the, the, a reasonable budget. You know, I hope that what we're doing is that we're sharing ideas that people can use um, in, you know, in a more average house. You know, maybe you can't afford a, you know, $50,000 mechanical system, but maybe you can afford you know, maybe you can employ some of the air sailing details in your project. Um, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. That's, that's kind of what we're hoping um, when we publish those projects, because I agree, they are out of reach for most people, you for know, us. <laughs> for, for, yeah, exactly. Um, it's the, it's the information that is important, not the, not the actual house that they're building is, is sort of how I, how I look at it. And also I would just, you know, he's, he's not alone. Um, we published an interview with Matt, um, I think it was the last issue of the magazine, and we did get um, some feedback about Matt's comments that were basically echoing exactly what he's saying here. Um, and one of those um, one of those letters w made it into the the next issue. So um, he's sort of not alone in having that kind of questioning the, the the value of you know seeing those projects so much. They're also really smart builders and really smart designers and architects. So there's a lot we can learn from them. Yeah. I mean, you know, back on, you know, how to keep stuff affordable. I mean, that's sort of, you know, one of the goals of the code. So, you know, a code minimum house is something that, you know, is supposed to be safe, but also affordable. And, you know, that you can really kind of use that as a guide. And I mean, you have a lot of options in the code and some of them are more expensive than others. But, you know, I mean, if you just stick to that insulation, you can do it correctly. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like there, there's such thing as a, a, a bad code minimum house and a good code minimum house. I mean, you can, you know, it's a spectrum within that sort of like narrow band. Absolutely. I, would, I think that that's a great point, Matt. I would say if you're truly building to the modern codes, like let's say 2015 and newer, and you're really paying attention to the provisions, especially the ones regarding air sealing, I think you're going to have a freaking really good performing house, especially in most parts of the country with, you know, more moderate temperatures. Maybe you need to go um, further in, in extreme hot and extreme cold places, but I tell you, it's it's ratcheted up in my lifetime. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, Andrew, thanks for the feedback and for listening very much. Uh, this comes from another Andrew. Um, so I mentioned not too long ago that I was still having difficulty finding N95 masks for 
sanding and mowing the lawn and things that, you know, people were wearing masks before you needed to protect yourself from uh, COVID-19. He says, I, I heard on the podcast and figured I'd share some information that may be useful. N95s are widely available on the usual online industrial supplier, Zorro, Digikey, McMaster Car, Magic Glove, Granger, MC. SC Direct, Air Gas, etc. There are also N95 equivalents, KF94, FFP2, KN95 available from a number of sources, and I'll put those on the podcast page. All of these sources have been verified with the manufacturers as direct buyers slash authorized resellers. Ask for mask buckles if you order. Make sure they seal properly. Get a variety of find that fits you best. You can reuse it if you let it sit in a breathable space, i.e. not in a plastic bag. For four days between uses, you can reuse it until it does not seal or 40 hours of wear time, whichever comes first. Mark the date of the last use on a storage container like a paper bag. Here's something I found interesting. Exhalation valves don't matter unless the place you are going has a rule against them. The CDC found that even with a valve, a respirator will still perform source control of particles as well as a cloth or surgical mask, which was a relief to me because I find those to be way more comfortable to wear. Hmm. So uh, Andrew explained that his, um, I asked him about why he was so knowledgeable on this. I, <laughs> I, I said, he says, early on in the pandemic, I was looking around for options because my sibling has cancer and also a developmental disability. So the combination of increased risk and difficulty in making sure she is per- taking precautions motivates to find something better than a cloth mask. We also had some experience looking for disposable respirators due to a few wildfire seasons. Finally, relatives overseas had a lot of info about seasonal mask wearing in general because it's much more common in Taiwan and Korea. Uh, So we wanted to find options for people that wouldn't take away from the supply of healthcare workers, and it turned out that by June, Korea had lifted its export restriction on KF94 respirators. And he has um, some research done by Aaron Collins who describes how the KN95 standard got to be accepted here in the U.S., which is kind of interesting. So thanks for that, Andrew. Yeah. I mean, it's basically just, you know, masks produced. The N95 is, you know, sort of the, the U.S. standard, and then you have all these other standards that are <laughs> exist around in the rest of the world. Like, not everybody does what the U.S. does. So, um, yeah, and a lot of those are, you know, basically just the equivalent of, you know, what we have. And sometimes they're, you know, designed to fit different face shapes, like, you know, the the KN95 that comes out of China is, you know, designed mostly to fit face shapes of people who live in, in China. China. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's possible, you know, that you might find something that fits better if you look at one of these other, you know, country standards. Mm. Uh, so uh, as an example, after getting this email, I was able to order a box of masks from McMaster Car. I ordered two. They fulfilled one, um, which is fine. It's 20 masks. That'll last me a long time. So mm-hmm. thanks for that. Ah, our first question comes from Tom. Hey, FHB podcast. After having done, having done a significant amount of work on the last two houses I've owned, I've discovered a serious problem. I'm wondering if any of you have solved this yet. If you do work on your own house in any part that gets normal traffic, how do you walk past your own work and not stare at the imperfections? Maybe I'm further on the perfectionist end of things, but I can't help but glare at the corner of the tile that doesn't quite sit flush or the slightest bump in the spackle or whenever I walk by my own work. I love working on my own house, but how do I live in it without achieving perfection? Tom. (laughs) <laughs> who's going to go first <laughs> well i mean i would probably say first like if you're not an expert at a thing you can't expect perfection and you know so like you you may have to lower your standards a little bit if you're you know doing the work yourself and you aren't doing this every day and you don't know exactly what you're doing you know just like you wouldn't just run out and you know start playing baseball and on your first day assume that you're going to be like you know a rod or something like that. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, I, I, I think if you want perfection, you have to be willing to th- tear some stuff out and do it over and, you know, use the lessons that you learned from the first time when you screwed something up, um, to do it right the next time. But I don't know, that's it, that, or just lower your standards and learn to live with it. That's what I do. <laughs> 
I say flat paint is a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a great option if you have bad drywall skills. That's what yeah, I would say. Yeah, can forgive a lot of sins. <laughs> I think you touched on something important there. I think you give more time to the places that you're going to see all the, all the time, right? I remember in my house in Stowe, um, sitting on the commode and looking at my bad drywall finishing all the time, right? And so the next time I had to do that work, I just spent more time making it look perfect and use more light than you think you need, especially with regard to drywall finishing, right? Yeah. I mean, I was surprised when I, you know, I had to tear out some stuff when I uh, tore out a wall between two rooms and, uh, you know, I had redone some drywall. And when I did it the first time, it definitely wasn't planing out. So I, I just tore it out and did it again. And I thought I had it a lot better the second time. Like I thought I had done a pretty good job and I thought I had used enough light. And then as soon as I painted it, it was like, nope, <laughs> it still looks like trash, <laughs> but it still, it looked better than it had the first time, but still not perfect. Now it's hidden behind a bed, so I can't see it. So that's that's one solution. Put furniture in front of it. <laughs> that's like a, or hang a poster there, whatever. Yeah. What do you say, Brian? Well, I, I, I mean, I feel for, for him because I have the same experience. Um, you know, that's how it's been, always been for me working on my own places. Um, and, I, and some of the, you know, some of the advice you guys already gave is really good. For one thing, after, you know, after a while, I learned to choose um, details and processes that I was, because I was going to do the work myself, there was no question to choose details and processes that I had the skills to do really well and to not do things, even if I kind of thought I wanted to do those things in my house, to not do them if they were way above my, you know, kind of above my skill level. And if I knew So would I you go so far as to hire someone to do those things or you just didn't do them? them? Right. I just, in, in, in the last house that I worked, that I that I owned and remodeled, I just would do something different. Um, I did hire people to do some stuff. Um, you know, drywall, not only do I not do well, but because of my perfectionism, I just keep sanding until it's perfect. <laughs> and that makes it, that makes a giant mess. And so, um, so I, I, you know, I stopped, I mean, of course I would do small drywall wall work, but the last couple of, of bigger, uh, drywall projects that I had, there was a drywall contractor right up the road that I, that I hired to do them. Um, Did you like just grab him by the arm and drag him over to your house? I've heard of people having to do that with their drywall finishing friends. <laughs> no, I, I paid him a lot of money. He was a real high end drywaller and I was the only way I was going to get him there. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's all kind of good advice. You know, that, that what this question reminded me of though, was the, was moving out, was selling that house and moving out of it. And, you know, there was part of me that was like, good riddance. You know, I don't want to look at this place anymore. But when I, when I, when we moved everything out and the house was empty and we were really leaving, like now we were out of there, you know, I was, I was sort of heartbroken. All that work that I put into it. And it actually did look, despite those, all those imperfections that I knew where it, there were things that I knew where they were and that always caught my eye when I was in the same room as them. Um, you know, it was like, it's really rewarding to work on your own house. And I kind of did I kind of wanted to buy like new furniture that fit the, the remodel and move back <laughs> in. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Jeff? Um, yeah, well, I, I, tend to not finish jobs because it's not wrong until it's done. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wind up redoing stuff anyway, because it's like, all right, well, I learned a lot there. Let's start that over again. My career has uh, introduced me to more craftspeople than most people get an opportunity to watch work, right? And uh, the one thing I've observed is that people who are good at it, don't have like inherently more skill perhaps, but they're willing to work at something longer. If something is not fitting or working out, they will just keep at it. They will just keep trying and do it over and over again until it looks the right way. And uh, I would say if there's one takeaway is just keep working at it and use lots of light because especially with regard to finishes, you don't know that there's a problem if you can't see it. Yeah, you know that's that's good. Um, that's good advice, Patrick. It also makes me think of making sure that you have um, the tools, the time, mm -hmm. and and the ability to do things in the right order. 
the, to sequence things properly. Because working on, on big projects on your own while you're trying to live in a house or uh, on the weekends, uh, those things get in the way, right? Uh, not having the, the professional tools or all the tools you need, um, not having the time you need to actually go slow, especially if it's your first time doing something, to really go, take it slow. And sometimes I often ran into trouble just because I tried to seek, I tried to work out of order on things because you know, I had just enough time to get something done, you know? So instead of doing what I should be doing, I'm kind of skipping ahead to doing something different and can run into trouble doing that too. Yeah. Don't worry about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you go to any restaurant or commercial building, like the quality of fit and finish of stuff is embarrassing. I like, what the heck? It's so interesting that you bring that up, Patrick. I agree with you so much. I'll go into a place and I'll be like, wow, this place is beautiful. And then when I start to look closely, I'm always like, huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually kind of pretty, pretty sloppy carpentry. Yeah. Sloppy carpentry and, and really bad tile work you see, you know. Yeah, I, I was sure. going to say, like, just go into the bathroom of any home center and look at the tile. And it's usually embarrassing. <laughs> <sighs> Oh, we have a letter from the Canadian audience here. Hello, Rick here in Ontario, Canada, Guelph. From another project, I've ended up with alley flooring from a bowling alley, two and a half inches thick hardwood, about one inch strips glued together, finished on top. The underside has some sort of pitch coat. What I'm wondering about, possibly for an addition on my house, could be that could this be used with in-floor heating? I will have whatever access is needed to the underside, which will be above a full basement. I suppose the question is, assuming the heat doesn't degrade the glues or cause some sort of warping, do you see any problem with the thickness? We heat large slabs of concrete. Would this be any different? Of course, it is very old wood given decades to cure as much as it would. Otherwise, I may just end up going into the butcher block business. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Rick in the rapidly thawing Great White North. All right. It'll work. You're going to need like really high water temperature, which is going to take a hit on the efficiency of your heating plant, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're not going to lose any heat, really. I mean, you can leave it at the same temperature. It's just going to take a really long time to react. So, you know, you're going to have to set your like your setbacks or whatever. You know, if you want the house to be warm in the morning instead of it coming on at five, it may have to come on at three in order for the space to actually warm up enough. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so like you can do in, you know, underfloor heating with carpeting and, and other thick flooring materials, hardwood and subfloor, you know, so that's an inch and a half thick. It'll, it'll work, but you do have to have um, warmer water, right, to make the floor respond, as Matt says. It's going to be slow. Yeah. I don't know. So we keep saying <laughs> like – uh in-floor heating is great for inefficient homes where you want to be comfortable, right? But for modern construction, when you have low load conditions, floors don't get that hot, right? It's, 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 not, it's not a comfortable way to heat anymore. And, and it's expensive and slow and, you know, yeah, work on I mean, the envelope. Yeah. I mean, I, when I first, you know, was, I guess, introduced to it, I thought it was a great idea. But then, you know, I was in some, you know, high efficient, you know, like very efficient houses that, you know, were very low load. And when that stuff was on, like, you couldn't even tell. I mean, you walked around on it and, it, and the floors felt cold to your feet, even though the, you know, the space felt comfortable. You know, like if you didn't have socks or shoes on, then it just, <laughs> it didn't seem like there was much of a benefit to it, you know, because it is extremely slow to react. And, you know, it's nice because, you know, this particular, this one house, you know, had concrete floors, you know, and it looked great and everything. Um, but I don't know. I, it just, <laughs> I don't think people, I don't think you get the benefits that you think you're going to get of the warm feet or whatever. Yeah. I think to, you know, to everything that, that you, you guys have said is, you know, kind of uh, jives with my understanding and, and what I've heard from people um, about radiant heating. I do think it's important to point out that there is some, it's not a one size fits all thing, right? There's many different types of radiant heating. It's certainly like a, you know, a radiant slab is very slow to respond. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, and maybe under like staple up might, might also be pretty slow. I think some of like the products like warm board are a little better. Um, when it comes to like response time, I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm sure they have information on that. Um, but I'm not sure if, if any like actual studies have been done, but I think they're, you know, depending on what type of, of radiant floor heating you use, um, I think it makes a big difference. Also what's what type of space it is. And as you guys both pointed out, the, the, you know, envelope conditions and, and whatnot, I, I, I think it's a great option for bathrooms for comfort. Um, but it just doesn't sound like it's a great solution for actual heating an actual heating system you could still use the flooring rick right you don't i mean you can use the flooring without in-floor heating just heat some other way and work on the envelope and you won't need in-floor heating yeah jeff you have thoughts on this um i was just thinking about the uh, conversation you just had with paul torsolini and his radiant heat um you know he's got a very efficient house and the the, the floors aren't warm but it's even and it's everywhere. Paul set, uh, is with the National Energy uh, Renewable Ener- Lab- Renewable Energy Laboratory, and uh, super smart guy. So if you all uh, want to learn more about my conversation with him, you'll have to check out the Pro Talk podcast with him. That was fascinating. Um, let us know how the addition comes, Rick. I think it's awesome that you have this flooring, so you're going to build a place to put it. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dear FHB crew, when the basement in my 1950s Kate began to leak, I busted out the perimeter of the concrete floor to drill half inch holes in the bottom concrete block cells. I installed Delta MS dimple board on the interior and weeping tile. Four days later, the water problem was solved. However, I never got around to patching the perimeter of the concrete fl- floor because during the repair, I noticed that my foundation footer wall, footing and walls were three to four inches out of level and that the floor was poured in the shape of a bowl and eight inches out of level. When the first floor was framed, they did a lot of interesting shimming slash notching to get it relatively level. I also discovered that I didn't have enough headroom to legally finish my basement as City Hall wouldn't allow grandfathering. So my project was put on hold. Seven years later, I want to finish this space and turn it into a hair salon so my wife can work from home. The payback will be less than three years. I found an engineer willing to design a benching system to lower the finished floor height approximately eight inches to match the floor height in the 90s edition. I had some concern with his design uh, regarding the excavation detail, and he has uh, drawings that we'll include in the podcast page. Um, Excavating detail straight down, then 45 degrees water management. It didn't account for weep holes in the concrete block and the insulation, airspace, and vapor barrier. So the engineer proposed digging interior of the foundation walls and footing to lower the basement floor, and uh, he didn't like that. So he decided to check into going down four inches. So I talked to the engineer about only going down four inches. Should I excavate the below the depth of my footer? footer? Two inches, two six below the footer will give me legal headroom, 611 in the main, and 6.5 under beams and ducts, but a four inch step tripping hazard between the old and the new foundation. How much riskier is the extra four inches for a fairly accomplished but slow DI wire? The foundation is 10 inch block walls on a 26 by seven inch footing on hard pan clay, five feet below grade. Appreciate the show and the sober second thought. Thanks, Nervous Neil. (laughs) (laughs) Salsa Marie, Ontario. Three hours north of pa- Patrick's favorite place to visit. He was talking about Sudbury, Ontario. Um, mm. So I looked, I didn't know where Sault Ste. Marie is, but it's the junction of three great lakes, Lake Michigan, Superior, and Huron. And it looks absolutely lovely there. And it includes the Canadian Bush Plain Heritage Center, which I must <laughs> absolutely check out when I'm up there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. So what's going on here, fellas? So he, he wants to make his basement deeper. He's going to dig interior of the basement foundation wall so he doesn't have to underpin the foundation and uh, do all that excavation under the foundation walls. What do you guys think? Hmm. I mean, if he's finding water, if he dug a test hole and he's in, in the water table, that sounds bad. Like, I don't know how you're going to have not have water problems in that 
you know, forever unless, you know, he has, you know, basically digs a deeper sump and then, you know, has everything drained to that. And then he's just going to constantly be pumping water out of there because there's always going to be water in the, in it. Until the lakes are all emptied, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, it's good. And that's the thing. It's just going to be a loop, you know, he's going to be dumping it into the lake and the lake's going to dump it back in his basement. So I don't know. I mean, there, there, I think there would be a way, you know, to do it if this were a new build, but I think it's going to be really hard doing, you know, the way that he's, you know, thinking he's going to do it. Just by digging a pool. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is not touching this. Yeah, I don't well, know. Basements are like, you know, I mean, you do, he already has a wet basement, right? He, and he remedied it. He, mm-hmm. he did, and he did, he did the right, he did a nice job. It sounds like remedying his, the water issues in his basement. So good job there. Um, but as Matt said, if he dug and found that the water table is, you know, is right around these, uh, right around the uh, height of his or depth of his footings. And he wants to go below that with his floor. He's, he's talking about spending a lot of time and money to finish a space that's going to be high risk. So, I mean, if he's good with that, then, you know, then go for it. Uh, the details seem, you know, uh, otherwise that I looked at the details and I'm certainly not an engineer, but they seemed smart and thoughtful. And, um, and, um, so with that, with that understanding of risk, you know, I don't know, I'd probably move mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to a space where he could have a, a work at home, um, salon for his, or have a partner. ADU, right? you know, a big yeah. shed, get a yeah. big shed. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I have, I have done this. Uh, I did not have a high water table. I, I dug down interior of the existing foundation wall footing in my house in Stowe to have a, you know, full depth basement in more of the, uh, living spit downstairs living space. And, um, it's slow. Uh, interestingly, I learned when Ian Schwant interviewed John Carroll for our anniversary po- podcast, that he has done this. And how many buckets of dirt did he say he took out of his basement, Jeff? Was it 30,000? Uh, I thought it was 16,000, but I, I could be misremembering. So it was <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Need to You've met help. him. It probably wouldn't surprise you to hear that, would it? Yikes. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Neil, if you, if you got water problems in your basement already, like I would leave it alone and patch the hole in the floor and build a ADU or build onto the house with a slab or some other means, you know? And honestly, a six, nine living six, five under beams is really low. That's going to be really uh, uncomfortable space to work for hours a day, right? Yeah, that, that those are still very low, still very low ceilings. I, yeah. you know, I think there's got to be a better way, Neil. Although I applaud your uh, willingness to dig out your basement. What el- what else should we say about this? I think, <laughs> I think Brian said it. You know, move or <laughs> or your solution, the ADU. <laughs> All right. The Canadian Bush Plain Heritage Center. Oh, man, that sounds fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, podcast. Thanks for discussing my propo- proposed, proposed project during podcast 248. I found my original invoice for my shaker two-panel d- doors I used in the edition. So this was Wayne, and Wayne asked about modifying his Luan doors in his uh, the older part of his house to make them look like uh, flat panel doors that are would match the ones in a newer part of his home. Uh, He says, I decided to buy new versus refurbished the existing flush doors. I don't have the luxury of a large enough garage workshop to tie up the space for 10 door modifications. I would never be able to do 10 doors in one day as stated in the YouTube video. I think that's kind of crazy too. There's no way that you could do 10 of those. (laughs) Um, I think my time would be better spent learning and honing my skills, fitting and hanging new doors as was suggested by yourself and guests. I have not prepped doors for hinges before, but have the appropriate routers. Any tips on jigs for hinge prep? Make my own or buy? 
I enjoy your contractor guests. I share their passion for good design, attention to detail, and execution. I spent much of my 50 years, 54 years in the architectural profession as a building science specialist, problem solving, and detailing. I love to solve a complex detail. Never stop learning. Wish you all the best. Take care. Be safe. Stay healthy. Wayne. Thanks, Wayne. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, are well, we just talking about... Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to... My response is pretty simple. Like, I've made... Um, I've made, you know, simple scrap plywood jigs for mortising all, all different sorts of hinges. And I have used but never bought um, a, you know, a manufactured um, jig. And I just feel like the, the, I mean, I guess if you have, if you're going to, you know, be installing, uh, something, you're going to be doing this work a lot and, or installing something similar a lot, maybe it's worth buying one of the manufactured jigs, but I find the plywood jigs to be so simple to make and use that, um, and, and affordable <laughs> that, uh, you, cause you just really need a scrap that that's, that's how I've always, that's why I've always, you know, mortised hinges. Unless, of course, I have one or two to do, and then I I just do them with a chisel. And a combo square. Yeah. 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 Matt? Yeah, same. I mean, I th- I, I've i done, I've routed a few of them, but I mean, I have done so few doors here that, you know, most of the time I just use a chisel. Um, but uh, Andy Engel did a good video on how to make that uh make that jig. I think it was a building skills thing, probably like four or five years ago, maybe. Um, it's somewhere on our website. I know it exists. I've looked at it. Mm-hmm. I've made that jig and I did use it one time, I think on one door, but you know, otherwise most of the time I just, you know, I'll even freehand it every once in a while. If it's just one door, <laughs> it's not the best way to go if you don't mind it being a little rough, but. Freehand it with a router map? Yeah. I just mark it out and then, you know, put the right size bit in there and, then and just go of, for it. Yeah. And then do you creep up to the line with the chisel after that? Or do you just, or do you actually try to get to the line with your router? No, I, yeah, I try to get relatively close and then I clean it up yeah. with a chisel afterwards. I mean, it's so simple to make that, to make that jig. And then, you know, you don't even have to, you have know, the, the little rounded corners. It takes so easy to, to, you know, knock them out with a, with a chisel. And I find it, I find it just super fast and, I, uh, Easy way to go. Well, I'll let you go, Jeff, and then I'll blather on here. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I've only ever hung one slab, and you know, I did chisel and knife, and so I think if you're going to do multiples, I think you got to have a jig, and I think it's probably worth investing in the commercial jig if you're going to do that many doors. But uh okay so that's what i was going to say too so wayne there's a good chance that all of your doors have the same uh hinge locations right so you know brian i think is talking about and matt too about like a single hinge that you're doing and then you're moving the jig and that works great and um if you all your hinges have the same spacing i would get a longer piece of plywood and make the three uh hinge locations on one piece which will save you a lot of time and the reduce the risk of mi- cutting on the wrong side of one of the hinge leaves or what have you, you know what I mean? You can, you can make those mistakes. So, um, and the model is, uh, Templeco is the company in California that makes plywood hinge jigs and you could have them make this for you too, but I would make my own cause it's super easy. My method is to trace the uh, hinge leaf onto a scrap of plywood and then use your router with the bit adjusted so it's only kissing the plywood and then locate the fence, uh, you know, by screwing a little block of wood next to the router base on the three sides. And then you actually use the router bit to cut the opening in the plywood. You know, you gradually work your way down, uh, you know, making passes, uh, using your your fences that you've put on your jig to guide the location of this hole that is then going to be cutting the mortises when you get to that part. Is that what you're talking about, Brian? That kind of style? Um, no, no. Um, I've always I've made mine even simpler. Um, just cutting, just you know, tracing the the hinge leaf to the to to a scrap of plywood, uh, cutting it out with a jigsaw, mm-hmm. and then using uh, a short uh, top bearing guided bit. 
it's setting the depth for the depth of the 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 hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and just in that, you know, that's it. That, and then just, just running the, running the router like that. And if it's, I, 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 I found a few different methods of attaching the, the, um, the jig to the door, but one of the easiest things, especially if it's paint grade is just to use some, some really, uh, small screws. I like to put a fence on the bottom side of the jig that you then clamp with a couple of uh, quick grip clamps to the door, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that works well too. Absolutely, Wayne. This is your golden opportunity by track saw because that is easily the best mm. way to bevel the latch side of the door, which you're going to also have to do in addition to your hinge prep and boring the uh, um, for the lock set. Um, I would also consider using your existing doors as the perfect template to set up your new doors. You could actually lay them on top or underneath the new door blank and use a combination square to transfer your hinge locations to the new door. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, likelihood that you're going to make a mistake on one of these is high. So I would say just double check, triple check everything before you start laying into it. Cause you can plane off a mismortished, you know, hinge, uh, but you, it's, you're going to make the door skinnier and it's going to be a problem. My tip is if you have difficulty getting your hinge leaves to line up the first time you hang the door, uh, loosen the screws a little bit and it'll go right on there and then you can tighten the screws again and, uh, it's, it's going to be solved. But you're missing an opportunity to do a Dutchman on that. You don't need to cut it off and, you know, thin the door out. You could just put a Dutchman in. <laughs> Dutchman patch. Using your router jig, right? <laughs> yeah, using your router jig. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get really good at this, Wayne. And, uh, you know, gonna, you're going to get some new tools. I don't know about buying the, the uh, manufactured jig that Jeff suggests. Those things are hundreds of dollars, and you're never going to use it again, right? Once you're done with your plywood jig, you can take it apart and get, you know, or use it for something else or save it. I used... I was looking for mine, but I, I guess I probably burned it in the wood stove <laughs> because I was going to show folks the method I used, but I don't have one anymore. Yeah. I think this is a true um, test of, you know, finished carpentry it is this. And uh, in 10, 10 doors, you're going to get pretty, pretty good at it. What's the, uh, did he say, did he say, if, is his an older house? I'm trying to remember the from the original question. I want to say it was like 80s because that's when you okay. saw these like Luan flush doors, right? Yeah, that's uh, right. Um, have you guys had to do this? So you said only like once or twice, Matt. How and you've yeah, done this once or twice, Brian? I've done I've, three. I feel like I've done a bit of it between um, a few different projects uh, with. Um, I've, I've built some entry doors. I've hung some new doors in interior spaces and I've used, I've used, uh, different versions of this, this type of jig on, uh, cabinetry stuff too. Um, I've done some, you know, done some cabinetry with butt hinges and, um, in at least one situation, I used a little laminate trimmer, uh, you know, small, real small router and a similar jig to mortise those. I would uh, make yourself a, a door bench, um, and I know yes. we've had have have had that um, feature in the magazine article. And you don't have to make something super elaborate, but you know, get a table set up to do this work because it's very difficult to manage doors while you're doing this work if you don't have the right kind of setup. Yeah, and he has enough of them to do to take the time to really set up a nice workstation for this. Yeah, and it's it's going to be time well spent because, you know, there's there's a lot of steps, and the doors are, you know, hard to manage, bulky. What uh, what's the, the prognosis for your um, new mortgage, Brian? Are you are you are you talking to another lender? Well, no the the broker thinks he can get an exception an exception. 
on that on the monument problem. Um, so we'll see. Uh, we're supposed to close in a week. Oh man! So we'll find out. Uh, we'll find out what happens um, soon. I guess and certainly the next time I'm on the podcast, I will know. Um, well, at least I will know whether we got this mortgage or not. Uh, what a hassle, man! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What what other hoops do you have to jump through when you're uh, buying a condo versus a single family house? Well, they just I don't I didn't have to do anything in particular, but the getting the condo approved is has has different um, qualifications. For example, the you pay the the homeowners association or the condo association pays the insurance on the you know, from the drywall out, everything from the drywall out. And so they have to have insurance that the uh, lender finds adequate and you don't have control over that. So mm-hmm. you can't, you can't like, they can tell you what kind of policy you have to have if, and, and what um, coverages you have, you, you have to have to get a mortgage if you're buying your own insurance. But when the condo, when the condo association holds the insurance, it either qualifies or it doesn't. Hmm. Um, they look at the number of units rented, uh, versus owned, and I think they want a higher proportion of ownership um, versus rentals. So all these different things that you wouldn't have if you were buying a single family home. Is it translate into a higher interest rate versus a single family no. mortgage? No, no. It's just harder to qualify. It's just it's harder to qualify the. So the the loan process, as you all know, goes like this: first they qualify you as a lender, and then they qualify the what you're trying to buy as a property. Because they want a, an asset that is not right. a risk. Right. So there's sort of two, two steps in that, in that way to the, to the mortgage process. So after they qualify you, then they start to look at the place and that's when they do the appraisal and all that kind, kind of stuff. Um, and so they have what they call a condo questionnaire and they send that to the, to the um, condo association president or whoever you know, is responsible for that type of thing. And, um, who would want that job the, to be the condo <laughs> association president? Yes. Yeah. Amy said, Amy said, maybe, Brian, maybe you'll get involved with the condo association. And I said, Amy, I'll get run right out of there because I'll be putting, I'll be putting PV on the roof. I'll be jacking up the rates so we can put in electric car chargers. <laughs> you'll have chickens running around. Right. They'll run me right out of there. I know it. I got to stay away from that. That's really interesting. I, I, I have no experience with uh, a condo, condo living. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear how it all goes. Me too. I wish you success. It's uh, I'm sure a little stressful. <laughs> it will be. Uh, it'll be a, a new. I mean, I guess it's not that that different than apartment living, but which I've done. I'm doing now, and I did it before. You know, on the last house I I lived in, so um, I've done it before, and it'll be similar, I guess, in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. What were the Civil War battles? Do you know? Um, I don't. I haven't done enough research. I'm trying to think of the name of the monument, but. Um, maybe I can find it. We can put it on the, on the show notes page. I'm kind of curious. <laughs> wow. That was, uh, that was interesting. So I wanted to give a shout out to my favorite, uh, YouTube presenter today. I, I got this cool t-shirt and can you guys see, see what that says on there? It says watch Wes work. So this guy is a auto mechanic and a uh, handy guy in northern illinois and he works on rusty vehicles so i can watch him struggle so i don't have to so wes thanks for the shirt thanks for the videos uh those of you listening uh watch wes work on youtube if you're into auto repair he does some pretty fun stuff and he's got a great delivery uh this typically uh midwesterner uh like kind of dead uh pan style of humor it's it's lots of fun to watch so you guys got big plans for the weekend? No. Disc golf. Good. <laughs> and garden. And that's it. Did you get your compost yet? Did I get my compost yet? Yeah. Oh, I got like 10 yards of compost. I still have probably three yards sitting in my driveway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of compost. How about you, Jeff? What are you doing? Um, Probably more yard work, more... Spreading, spreading more mulch, exciting things, you know. Mm-hmm. 
Brian, you gonna go on a motorcycle ride? No, I guess I have to pack. I oh, guess yeah. you do. So you're not hiring movers. You're doing this yourself. Yes. Yes. That's a I big job. I couldn't hire a mover. No. Just like I couldn't hire, a, you know, a lot of things. I, I it would <laughs> it would drive me nuts to to watch someone else do something that I can do. Good for you. If it was out, like going back to our conversation before, if it was out of my skill level, I would hire a mover. But I can carry boxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sorry I'm not down there to help you, buddy. I am too, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> he's well, an expert I'm, mover. He moved a bunch of stuff for me the other day. He's good. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to get you back for that, Milham. <laughs> 400 pounds of railing parts. That was awesome. Yeah. Jess helped too. She was hugely helpful. Well, that's good. And Aaron and the folks at the cabinet shop, they loaded it with a forklift. That was I got to figure out a way to get a forklift into my life. Anyone has any ideas on why I need a forklift, please share them. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Brian, Matt, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks very much for listening. Happy building. <laughs>